Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Speak Out series. My name is Rally Chakarova, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bold Foundation. I'm also your moderator for today's career discussion, focusing on the masonry trade. The Bold Foundation has a very simple but important mission, to inspire the next generation of construction professionals right here in the greater Toronto area. One way to do that is to ensure that young people have the information they need to choose a career that they're passionate about and can be successful in. This series facilitates discussions on the in-demand careers in construction and how young people can get started. Each panel is made up of industry professionals, including union reps, employers, training providers, and apprentices to provide useful insights into the education and training requirements, physical demands, what to expect day-to-day, -day, and advancement opportunities within the specific construction career. I want to acknowledge and thank our series sponsors, RBC Future Launch for their generous support of this important initiative to help close the information gap and get more youth interested in construction careers. Let's hear from our sponsors now. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Beckles and I'm the Vice President of Social Impact and Innovation here at RBC. Today, youth are the most unemployed age group in Canada with almost 800,000 young Canadians not currently in employment, education, or training. Canada's skilled tradespeople that have long been the backbone of our economy are more critical than ever. And so is solving this sector's main challenges, the underrepresentation of women and immigrants, the need to double down on digital training, and the ongoing stigmas around trades careers. And while these challenges are significant, so are the opportunities. Through the RBC Future Launch partnership with Bolt, we aim to ensure that you understand what opportunities are available in the skilled trades industry and how to get started in a career that you are passionate about. Because at RBC, we see a future in your future. Today's discussion focuses on a career as a brick and stone mason. Let's take a quick look at some of the work the skilled trade does on a high rise building site. Let's take a look at the masonry crew, also commonly known as the bricklayers. This crew starts by reading the architectural drawings, looking for the specific wall types that are to be built from masonry, seen here as hollow concrete block filled in with the diagonal lines. Next, they read the floor plans for the layout details on where these walls are to be built. You can see here the diagonal lines on the walls around the garbage chutes and air shafts show that they are to be built from concrete block. Laying masonry then starts with mixing mortar in a mixer, shown on the left, and then the batches of mortar are brought to the masons in a forklift. Working from scaffolding is very common, so as a mason, you learn about the safe way to erect scaffolding. The foreman crew builds the essential structural concrete walls that are required to hold up the building above. Then, masonry block walls are built in the places where they are required either for a high strength purpose or an enhanced fire resistance rating, like here for these electrical closets. On this wall, the masonry crew has installed ties embedded into the block wall, projecting out, which will be used later to secure another layer of decorative masonry called masonry veneer, typically either stone or clay bricks. Not all of the brick walls you see have been built by the masons. Here you see that brick-faced precast concrete panels made in a factory have been installed, giving a very similar finished appearance. With that great visual of the work, let's meet our industry panel. Tim, let's start with you. Please tell us about your role, organization, and how you got started in this career. Hi, and uh, thanks for having me on. My name is Tim Maxson. I'm the Director of Training for the Ontario Masonry Training Centres. And uh, I got started in this uh, career because my father-in-law was a bricklayer or brick and stone mason. And uh, he uh, offered me a job. I was actually immigrated to Canada from the U.S., don't kill me. Um, and uh, that was, you know, initially, whilst I was waiting for all the things to uh, get finalized with my immigration papers and so on, uh, I worked with him. And uh, initially, I didn't really think that I would 
you know, stick, stick with it. I just kind of did it as a job, but uh, I grew to really enjoy the work I was doing. And so continued on, worked with the union, worked in uh, private sector, built custom homes and so on, ended up getting an offer to work as a, uh, as an instructor and uh, actually was Robert's instructor, I think. And uh, then, uh, then went into the administrative side and, and, and my current role as a director of training. So that's a short story. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, Robert, we'll go to you. Please tell us about your role, organization, and how you got started. Okay. I, uh, I've been a Mason now for approximately 30 years. Uh, when I did get started, like Tim had mentioned, he was my instructor 30 years ago. And I learned every all my theory I've learned, I learned through the Ontario Masonry Training Center, which was a great starting point for anybody. Uh, from there, I was a Mason for approximately... Another 13 years, because then after that, for 17 years now, I've been a foreman for Medigroup, still am, and uh, continuously moving forward. And that's about it. That's fantastic. Thank you. And Julia, great to have you with us. Uh, same question. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. My name is Julia Rose. I am a Red Seal Brick and Stone Mason and a business owner. I currently am the owner and operator of the business, uh, the Brick Chick Masonry here in the city. Um, I started out this career and this adventure at the Ontario Masonry Training Center. I did a pre-apprenticeship back in 2018 where I had zero construction experience whatsoever. I kind of went into it on a, a blind leap of faith and ended up falling in love with the trade. A couple months down the road, figuring out that my great grandfather and his dad were both in fact Masons. It wasn't really something that was talked about in our family, but I think it helped me like keep pursuing that dream, knowing that, you know, this this beautiful trade was in my history and it did run through my blood. So I was super excited to like carry on the family history. Um after I completed my training, I was in a union bricklaying company for my entire apprenticeship, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but I was ready to get out on my own and to explore the city and to see what other opportunities lay out there for me. And I'm continuing to grow and to see where this career goes. And it, it's been super exciting. And it's it's a pleasure to continue to talk about it and to inspire the future generations and especially other women that are interested in joining this trade. Well, thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Already from your short introductions, what I love is just the diversity and progression of your careers and just, to, you know, already a little glimpse into where you can take this trade once, you, once you've owned it and once you're good at it, that you can become an instructor, you can be a, a supervisor in a management position, and even an entrepreneur. So, Thank you all for, for those great introductions. And I'd love to dive into the uh, many questions that have already come in um, about this trade. So uh, Tim, let's start with you and, and the basics. Um, what is a brick and stone mason? And what does this trade actually do as part of the construction process? What sectors uh, do, do skilled trades people work in? And is there any difference between masonry work and brickwork. Uh, that's a, a lot of different questions, but we're gonna hand it over to you to, to give us an overview of this amazing trade. All right, thanks. Uh, like you said, lots of questions there and I'll see, hopefully I hit them all, but um, you know, people call us uh, bricklayers, block layers, stone masons, uh, brickies and so on, a lot of different names, um, but basically brick and stone mason is the official title here in Ontario. If you were to get into the trade and go through an apprenticeship, that's what you would find out the name is. And uh, so large variety in what you can do in our trade, as you can see a little bit of stonework behind Robert there, you can get into refractory work, which is uh, lining of kilns and furnaces. Uh, which is sort of a very different part of our trade, but they still belong to the same union. And some people do that exclusively and other people do it once in a while and a uh, very good high paying job, but it uh, does require you to move around quite a bit to where these uh, you know, uh, companies are, these um, installations such as a brick plant, and a cement plant, um, lots of different things where they would have these furnaces located. So you can't, um, you, you have to go there. And they're very time sensitive jobs where you have a, about a month or two to get the work done and then you're out of there because they're losing millions of dollars while the furnaces are being repaired. 
Then restoration work is another huge side of our trade now. And um, Canada is getting older, lots of old buildings, the parliament buildings in Ottawa are employing, you know, anywhere from 50 to 150 masons, you know, uh, you know every day. And uh, of course, the weather and, and certain parts of the contract make those numbers go up and down. The residential side, which I think Robert is um, mainly involved in, uh, which could be housing or high rise. No, not uh, no. commercial, mostly commercial. High rise. High rise, high, high rise. So the, there's high rise residential, low rise residential. So all these different things and, uh, you know, various um, groups and masons, bricklayers are, you know, attached to them, have decided that that's either where, you know, where they've landed or where they want to be. But you have that chance to move around if you would, uh, if you desire. Absolutely. I think this was a great answer. You you definitely covered uh, a lot of it. And I, and yeah, Robert, thank you for the, for the background visual there, because it's some really beautiful example of the artistry that can be behind this trade as well. Uh, Julia, since uh, you're sort of closest to your apprenticeship uh, on the call here, I'd love for you to tell us, uh, you know, look back to your first year or getting started as an apprentice and tell us what your day to day looked like and, and how that changed uh, as you became a journey person. So starting out uh, my apprenticeship, I was absolutely terrified to enter the workforce. It's a scary world out there, especially something that's so dominated by men. But Honestly, everybody that I went to school with and all of my instructors and everybody at the OMTC made it so accessible for me to get into the workforce. As I said, I did the pre-apprenticeship. So once I was done that, I entered into a union company, Clifford Masonry, and I did uh, my paid work placement with them and they decided to keep me on. So without that kind of push right into the workforce, I would have been, I feel like I would have had a hard time getting involved and trying to find an employer and making them realize like, hey, I'm actually like, I'm interested in this, take me seriously. So that was super helpful for me. Plus it gave me all the tools and all the kind of the know-how to even go in and say, okay, I can read a tape measure. I can somehow, you know, somewhat use a level, like kind of use my hand tools a little bit. So that definitely helped. Moving into my next few years, level two, level three, I got to experience a little bit more time on the tools. I had a really great foreman at my company who, you know, he, he saw some, something in me and he saw that I was, uh, able to keep up with the boys. So I, I was on the wall quite a bit. I didn't have to spend my entire apprenticeship making cuts or laboring like some poor fellows do. And ho hopefully the harder you work, the less time that you have to spend doing those kind of things. Now that I'm a journey person, I, I love to be able to have the freedom to be able to pick the jobs that I want, doing the site visits, reading blueprints, making quotes and estimates for people is something I really enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis, more of like the business side of it. And then having those skills learned over the last few years to go and confidently say like, this is how I think that things should be done. And uh, this is something that I can definitely do for you. It makes me feel very, very powerful to be able to learn to trade like this in only four years. So I, I think it's pretty incredible. Well, I think you're pretty incredible. So way to stay, <laughs> way to stand that high standard there. So thank you for that. And and Robert, maybe we'll come to you with a similar question. Um, so as an employer, can you tell us the type of duties bricklayers do on many sites as part of the high rise process? And what skills someone should have to be successful in that trade? Well, as far as skills go, I'm thinking the number one thing I would tell everybody it's high end coordination. You need that. You need to be able to visually see what you're doing. Your eye is not going to lie to you. If something's wrong, it's going to be wrong. And you're going to be able to pick up on that. As far as the duties go, well, we're putting in block and brick. Uh, they just got to make sure they're following their lines. They're make sure their walls are straight and plumb. And the last thing we want to do is take down any walls. So I'm always moving forward, keep putting up walls and, um, one of the things that I've always stressed on a job site just before anybody does start work is make sure you have a tidy area where you're working. Make sure there's no debris, no rubble. If you start clean, you're going to finish clean. And our entire industry is all about how clean we can be at the end of the project because that's what's going to end up showing your workmanship. Because shabby workmanship just means that you didn't do your job properly. And we don't like that. So we all want to be working well. And that's pretty much what everybody does every day. And they strive for that. But I find that a lot of bricklayers do strive for wanting to be perfect. 
It's not just to come in and get their day. They want to make sure that we're artists and we enjoy doing the work we do. And we just want to make sure it all looks good at the end of it all. That's about it. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you. And uh, Tim, maybe we'll come back to you to start unpacking some of these terms. Uh, you know, we, we did talk about an apprenticeship and some people might not be familiar with what that entails. So can you talk about what an apprenticeship is for a brick and stone mason? And uh, what are some of the benefits to that training approach? And then how does someone uh, finish their apprenticeship and become a journey person like, like all of you here on the call? All right. Uh, yeah. So our, our trade in uh, Canada is considered to be a voluntary trade, but it is also a red seal trade. So that means that um, you don't have to go through a, an apprenticeship if you choose not to. You could learn on the job and continue on and, and have a career that way. It could well mean that you're limited to whatever the person you're you know men who's mentoring you or the company you're working with. And so uh, that's why some people will do their careers and only know how to lay bricks because they work for a brick a company that only laid bricks and they never learned how to do block or stone. Uh, on the other side of things, if you decided to get through an official apprenticeship, you would register as an apprentice. You would have to find a sponsor company or a sponsoring group, such as a union or so on, that has that ability to sponsor you. And then, um, or you could go through a pre-apprenticeship uh, route, which Julia did, in which case you don't need that employer up front, but you will find get a job placement and uh, an employer will uh, pick you up after the fact when you've had your training. Either way, you would be registered as an apprentice somewhere along that line and you would continue on. Usually an apprenticeship in our trade will take you around four years to complete, depending on the hours that you accumulate both on the job and returning to do your in-school training uh, every year. And so if you went the typical route, you would work for about a year with your employer and then come in for your level one, go back to work uh, for another year or so, come back for level two and so on until you completed the three levels of training and accumulated about 5,600 hours of in-school and on-the-work uh, site um, training. Once you've completed all of that, then you're uh, eligible to write your Red Seal exam of qualification. And uh, if you pass that successfully, then you would become what we call a journey person at that uh, point. And uh, then, you know, sort of the sky's the limit. And we've had, uh, you know, some examples here on the show of where people have decided to end up. I myself have tried a number of different things and I've been an instructor. I, I still own a, my own masonry company. I've had the opportunity of, of having my own company, worked with my son for a good number of years until he decided to, you know, look at other options that, in his life. And that was a great time. So there are so many um, benefits and options as the more experience you uh, gain, the more time you've spent on the job, the more things you've learned, then the more opportunities open up uh, for what you can do with that. And so it really is, uh, as Julia mentioned, working hard, um, you know, listening to what those who are your, you know, your boss or your foreman or whatever are asking you to do, doing that well. I'm glad that, uh, you know, Robert, you know, emphasized the fact of doing good, clean work uh, that you can be proud of. These are all things that are going to push you up the ladder and uh, give you lots of opportunities as you move forward through that. I would say just to put a plug in, we do have pre-apprenticeship programs starting right now. So you can go to our Ontario Masonry website and uh, get that information, get an application and that's starting from ground zero, as actually both of the other uh, people on it here started, and me. I mean, I started not knowing anything. My father-in-law said, hey, come along and, you know, put a put a trowel in my hand and said, this is how you spread mortar. Go ahead of me and spread mortar while I lay bricks and, you know, do the joints or cut the bricks or cut the blocks. You know, that's the process you're going to go through, You the learning process. Initially, it does feel a little bit like you're doing sort of the um, <clears throat> the, the grunt work or the labor work, but uh, you do get through that and uh, you get to the point where you get to do the fun stuff and you get to really enjoy and look back on those projects that you've done and just say, wow, I, I did that. I, I worked on that project. I built that. So it's fun. Of course. And, you know, I'll say any of the young people that we work with, we always encourage them to uh, look 
to a training uh, program if there is one, because it's such a, a much better structured and um, like safe environment to learn and make mistakes rather than than doing it on the job side. And and I love what you said, because uh, I think there's sometimes the inclination to skip ahead to the, you know, fun stuff, uh, but the basics have to come first, right? And and make sure that you you know how to do it right and, and do it well. Uh, that was a great overview. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, Julia, we'll come to you because I think from the video, we saw these sort of big cinder blocks uh, that are used on the high rise side. And I think when people think about stonework, um, you know, the you sort of your brain jumps into like, that's heavy. So I just want to ask you, you know, how important is the physical strength and endurance as part of this work? Um, and also working at heights and in all weather conditions, if you can speak to that. Uh, yeah, the physicality behind what we do as masons is extremely important. You need to be able to pick something up that is already heavy and be able to do that, especially with blocks, you know, 500 more times that day, right? So it's not just pick it up and put it down once. This is an all day event that you almost have to train for. I went into this and I was a, I was a personal trainer prior. So I had a lot of experience with lifting and I was weightlifting and doing Olympic lifting. So being physical and being strong had always been a really important part of my life. So I feel like if you do have that, you know, that connection to your body and you, if you, lifting feels good, you, you should love this career because you get to do it all day long, every day. If it makes you feel really good, you don't have to go to the gym, which is amazing. Um, block work is definitely challenging, especially like as a small person, I'm very short. Sometimes you have a man laying next to you on the other side of the wall and he's six foot five and I'm five foot two. So you have to be able to adapt readily on the line with another person. Sometimes I am standing on blocks and it is, it's just the way it is. You will adapt if you want to, if you're willing to put in the work and work hard, it, it can be extremely fun. And I haven't had any limitations that have held me back from being able to do the job. As long as you can kind of be creative and, and work around those things, it's, it's totally fine. Well, thank you for saying that. And I think two for one uh, work and workout uh, definitely may appeal to people. <laughs> save, save an hour at the gym every day. And what about uh, all weather conditions? Do you, do you find that you have to work in all seasons, the indoors, outdoors? Right. And uh, yes, to that, um, I have worked throughout my career so far in every season. I haven't had any any time off. This isn't the first year I have just because I decided to take a little bit of time off in the winter because I was outside of a union company. In the union company, I was working through the summer and then um, through the winter, there's always jobs inside especially on the restoration side, they they have things figured out. You could be doing a little bit more of light work in the winter, chipping out mortar joints, grinding, that sort of thing that doesn't involve having to lay any units outside when it's too cold. Or you mm. could be inside laying block walls or brick walls or whatever it may be. So I find uh, all season work is is definitely there and you don't have to worry about getting laid off in the winter really because there is so much work still to be done um working at heights as well it is it, you know sometimes you're up on the swing stage and you're you're 30 20 30 stories in the air or you're at the top of the scaffold and you look down and you're like oh yeah i'm pretty high right now uh you kind of have to be able to get your mind uh, around that but the more you do it the easier it gets trust me. it honestly to this day the the most fear I have is on ladders. I still think they are the scariest uh, height, you know, related tool that we have. I'd rather be 50 feet up in the air on a swing stage than on a ladder. So um, I think it's all in your mind and like how big you can create that problem. But as long as you're wearing your PPE and you're, you have your proper training, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Right. For safety first, always. Uh, exactly. Thank you for saying that. That was great. Uh, Robert, I'd love to come to you and, and talk about uh, sort of the average hours uh, during the day and for the week and what that looks like for um, the Masons that want that work under you in these uh, high rise uh, sites. And also just uh, something that Julia said, is the work seasonal on your end? No, we'll start with the seasonal. I'm not going to say that masonry is seasonal. However, we are subjected to weather conditions. It raining, we can't work. Extreme cold weather, we can't work. Extreme heat, we can't work. With that said, a mason typically will work almost every day, with the exception of those days. 
we do put in eight hours a day and we'll do 40 hours a week. The laborers will do 42 and a half hours. So it is a full week. It is a full amount of work. And to be quite honest with you, in the last, I think, 17 years, maybe even longer than that, I can't remember any time I had off. <laughs> we've, worked, we've worked all the time. And like Julia said, there's plenty of work out there to be done, and especially in the high rise sector where you're protected from the, the weather elements. When we're working down in the P levels, it's nice. It's not really warm, but it's warmer than being outside. Mortar won't freeze on us. We can continue to work. We can get the job done and we just move forward. And that's about it. And there are areas when we do get up high in the building that we need to tarp off. We do need heat that manages to keep us warm and uh, we muster through it and we finish off our day. That's about it. Well, that's great. And and in terms of uh, starting the day, is it early in the morning? Does that vary depending on other conditions? What does that look like? We're finding in the high rise sector, the um, the law is, is that we're not allowed to make any noise until seven o'clock in the morning. So we have to start at seven or later, but we prefer to start as early as we can. And uh, we go right up until our eight hours and then we go home. And that would be it. That's great. Um, Julia, I'll come back to you because uh, you, you talked a little bit about the physicality, but I'd love to hear, and you know, you said that that's not really a, a challenge for you because of your background, but I'm wondering, are there any other challenges that you've experienced as part of your apprenticeship and, and learning this trade? And then on the flip side of that, uh, what is the part of the work that you like best? Yeah, uh, challenges I've faced just, I think, um, coming into it with very little experience, I was afraid of what people would think of me, uh, afraid of walking onto a job site as a woman and being taken seriously. I didn't, those are all kind of internalized issues that I kind of had to push into the back burner and just focus on why I'm there. What are the, what's the goal that I have set up today? I'm not trying to prove myself to anybody. I just need to be there and do the work and do a good job and have good workmanship and go home at the end of the day. That was the most important thing. Challenge wise, um, after I had a, a bit more experience, it was almost this, there's this mentality out there that everybody thinks that they're the best bricklayer. So being in my own head and, you know, keeping your ego in check and trying to learn from the people that have been doing this for longer than you've been alive, instead of shutting them out, if they have a critique about you, listen to them. It, it is the most important thing that you're going to, you're going to take in because that's what you are as an apprentice. You're, you're learning, you're absorbing, and you need to take them seriously and, and respect, uh, play, uh, pay respect where it's due is uh, definitely very important when you are an apprentice. So I think it'll take you a lot farther if you're willing to just roll. Sometimes there are punches, sometimes People are in bad moods. Foremans can be aggressive or angry, not aggressive, but you know what I mean? Like everybody has their bad days, right? So we've all been there. Uh, take it day by day and just, uh, it will, it'll come to an end eventually. Well, that's, um, uh, that's some great advice. Yeah, thank you. And then the part that you enjoy the most? Uh, I enjoy the artistry behind it. As Robert was saying, we are artists and being able to create something beautiful that can stand the test of time is has always been very inspiring to me. That's definitely my favorite thing. Yeah, I love that. And I'm not surprised to hear you say that because I think across uh, the uh, industry professionals that, that work in construction, one of the most rewarding things is sort of pointing to a building and saying, you know, I helped build that. And, you know, to Tim's point about... Um, the renovation that's uh, both with Queen's Park here in Toronto, but then also in Ottawa with the Parliament building. I mean, that is that is the most part of history, I think, that you could ever have. So talk about a proud moment right there to be able to, to work on a project like that. Um, thank you for your answers. Tim, uh, you have the pleasure of answering our always most popular question, and that is about the money. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about the pay structure and what the average starting salary is, what the earning potential are is for these trades, and, and how it changes um, as someone progresses through their apprenticeship? Sure, yeah. um, be be happy to do that. Um, you know, money's important. We all need it to live on. But uh, if it's your, probably your main goal in getting into a career, then you might be disappointed with many different, you know, many different trades, many different jobs. Because uh, you know, in my mind, you want to be doing something that you enjoy doing. 
And, um, you know, not to say that I enjoyed every single day of my career in masonry, whether I was training, whether I was, you know, working on the wall, whether whatever that may be administratively, but every day has its challenges. Um, But generally speaking, you start out at uh, first year rate, which would be today's uh, rate somewhere between 20 and maybe 22, $23 an hour, somewhere in that range. If you were sort of just trying it out for the summer, you might end up getting a little less than that. If you just kind of strike up a conversation with some mason on the on the street, then he'd probably start you out a little lower and then see what, what you're made of and move up. Uh, second year, moving up, you know, about 15, 20%. So you're up into 25 to, you know, $28 an hour. Third year, moving into the 30s, you know, mid 30s. And then finishing off, uh, you know, I think we're up in the $45 an hour range as a journey person. But it depends on the area you're in. It would depend with the company you're in. And that's if you're working for somebody. So if you were had your own company eventually, then, you know, the sky's the limit. You can either be making millions or losing millions, uh, depending on how good you are at uh, what you do. So, you know, if you go into business for yourself, there's lots of challenges that you have to uh, work through, lots of paperwork, uh, lots more chances of you, uh, you know, there's just as big of chance of losing money as there is of making money. I tell people, you know, some days when I work for myself, I'll be making, you know, $100 an hour plus, and there's other days when I think I'm probably making about $5 an hour, just because of the nature of the work, the job sometimes will go south and uh, you, you could do it. But if you're working for somebody else and they've you have an agreement, then of course you get the steady paycheck. And some people like that, they just like to go to work, do a good job and go home and, and enjoy their life. Other people have uh, ambitions to, um, you know, do more and uh, get into other, uh, other, other uh, opportunities within the trade. So, um, yeah, I, I ho- hopefully I've answered your question. Yeah, you have. And and once again, I think uh, what's an important thing to highlight is that variety of options, right? Everybody has different ambitions, different circumstances with their lives and, and what they like to achieve. So it is nice that you can just uh, go in, you know, do, do, do your job, do it well and go home. And if you have aspirations to go into management or, or you know, start your own business, then that's also an option for you as well. Um, Robert, uh, we'll come to you. I'd love to hear uh, a little bit more about the advancement opportunities uh, that are available in this trade from your perspective. As far as a mason goes, we uh, we start off as journeyman, or sorry, start off as apprentices, apprentices. We work through, and yeah, it is a little difficult, but somewhat rewarding. From the apprenticeship, you're going to move into being coming, becoming a journeyman. And that journeyman can take you down... A bunch of different roads like Tim was mentioning the restoration refractory you can choose to want to do more stonework you can choose to want to do more block work you can choose to want to do more brick work the work is available it's out there and uh, what your passion is is what you should strive for and there's lots of opportunities on that and after being a journeyman you do have the opportunity to become a foreman which I was lucky enough to have that uh, from the foreman's position you can always move into a supervisor's position uh, management position there's a lot of opportunities for growth in masonry with large companies and it's a rewarding career they just it continues to keep getting better and can you maybe speak a little bit about the difference uh between you know being a journey person and working on one of these sites and and your role as a foreman what's what's the different what's the big difference there the bricklayers that come out pretty well know exactly what they're doing they have all the answers they've They've proven this to me a million times, which is fine. My main goal and my main objective when we're doing work is I'm going to tell them where to put the wall. I may even lay the first course for them. Well, majority of the times I will. And I'll tell them where to stop. That is their job. That is my job to make sure they're putting the walls where they're supposed to be and ensure that the quality of the workmanship is always there. And one of the key elements now, and we've noticed this in the last 15 to 20 years, is safety. Mm -hmm. Extremely important to keep all my men safe every day. We, we go over a lot of safety practices, we talk about it a lot, and we just ensure that at the end of the day, we all go home safely. And that's it. That's great. That's it. <laughs> I think that's a really important, that's a really important, yeah, it's an important part. But yeah. 
Thank you so much, Robert. Um, Julio, I'll come back to you because at the beginning of the intro, you kind of mentioned that this is still a, a very male dominated field and, uh, but that you've had, you know, uh, really good and supportive and experience uh, progressing through your apprenticeship. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience as a woman in this profession. And, and also more importantly, if you would recommend this as a career option for other women. Yeah, I would a thousand times recommend it to other women as a career option. I my only I say this all the time. That my only regret is that I didn't start sooner. I started when I was 22 and I'm 27 now and I've completed it. But if, let's say I was right out of high school and 18, like, you know, becoming a journey person by the time you're 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 23 years old would be absolutely incredible. So um, definitely recommend that. And being a woman has I've never seen any um, challenges because of the way that I've always put myself out there and I've, I've worked and I've put, you know, all of my effort into what I do. If you go out there and you work hard, everyone is going to treat you exactly the same as everybody else. Um, I never felt like I got any special treatment or any negative treatment just because I was a woman. So if that's what's scaring you from entering this trade, uh, that, that shouldn't be the thing that deters you if you know if anything let your fear of heights do that for you like don't don't let your your femininity be a be a um a setback or anything like that because it I just don't see it um I've never really worked alongside other women some once in a while like you will see other other female masons there are a few and I've I've been have the pleasure to meet a few but um just know that you you will feel a little bit isolated there you know you're you aren't going to come across many women out there but that's okay and hopefully by doing more of these things we'll be able to inspire other women to join these trades and and those numbers will change a little bit and you might feel a little bit more um integrated so hopefully uh we can keep inspiring other girls and i definitely wouldn't wouldn't let you uh get scared off because of that for sure well, I love that. And I and I feel compelled to do a plug here for OBC trades women, because I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think in some cases, women uh, may be the only ones uh, on site, but yet there is a huge community of, of skilled trades women that uh, support each other, that that can that can connect. Um, are you able to speak a little bit about uh, the, the programs and just the, the organization that, um, that that involves that? Yeah, so OBTC is um, an amazing program that highlights other women in the trades and promotes our abilities and that we are out there and and makes it known and proud. And I was uh, honored last year to be able to have a highlight video and kind of showcase what brick and stone masonry is, but as well as, you know, putting a woman on the on the front page of that Um was awesome to be able to see and to show people that it, we are capable of, of doing this. Uh, there's also like such a growing network on social media and other platforms for other women in the trades because we somehow we're not meeting each other on these sites once in a while, but there are so many of us now um, out there and we all have the same experiences. If, if we did have bad experiences, we are able to share that with each other and talk about that. And it just makes it a little bit easier because it, you know, sometimes you do feel a little bit isolated so more and more of these programs are, are coming to light and I am, um, feel so honored to be a part of it and to, uh, to share that with others. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for very quickly becoming a mentee to a mentor, because obviously uh, that's really what's needed in order to make sure that women looking to enter these trades are feeling welcomed and included uh, as part of that. And that there is a community and there is a support out there. Um, and especially, you know, this might be a bias, but I guess we'll do it our way. This type of precision work, I feel like women are, are naturally a little bit tend to be more inclined to like the detail mm -hmm. uh, oriented aspect of it. So so that's really great to hear. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I think we have a pretty great idea about what the trade looks like and what's involved uh, within it. And now I'd love to talk uh, a little bit about how to get started. And um, Tim, maybe we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, what do you look for when you're assessing new applicants to either start their apprenticeship or start the pre-apprenticeship program? Are there any basic requirements that they need to have? Do they need a high school diploma? If you can speak a little bit about that. 
Okay, great. Uh, I just wanted to finish off a thought that Julia started there is sure. starting when you're young. Um, the probably the best and easiest way to get into any trade is the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. And uh, the Ontario and, and federal governments have been very good about supporting people in trades. Um, and that's one of the programs that when you're in high school, if you investigate that, you uh, can get a jump start on your trade you're, you're like probably anywhere from five to ten years ahead of most people who kind of wander around at different places and then finally decide that this is what I want to try um and so yeah like Julie said when you're uh 20 you know 2 23 you're a journey person you're making 45 50 bucks an hour and uh you've got uh, you know a great career ahead of you uh, far more than most people who kind of start that at a 25 to 30 year old range when they kind of decide oh I better make a a move here so um I did want to put a plug in for that. We do have Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program op opportunities every year. One, we have one running currently in our, well, several running at various locations. We have locations in Ottawa, uh, Mississauga, Toronto, Kingston, uh, not Kingston, sorry, um, London and uh, Windsor. And uh, so generally every year there are opportunities for all of these programs that we've been talking about, apprenticeship programs, pre-apprenticeship programs, and OEAP, Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. So those are all available. And when you're getting started, I mean, really it's the, it's the desire. Uh, you want to do this. You want, this is, you've kind of done a little bit of research. You've uh, seen what masonry is. You have a, a decent idea about it and that desire to get into it and stick with it, um, you know, throughout, even though you're gonna have some challenges um that's but we're looking for people who you know they they say you know I, I I've always wanted to do this or you know I like working with my hands I I really like working you know mostly outdoors or you know I don't mind the elements that much I like physical work I like to you know those types of comments are, are the ones that we're uh, listening for and usually the ones that are going to be successful you know those who say i don't really know what i want to do i'm just kind of you know trying this out see if it's a you know they may or may not work out uh, nothing wrong with that but the people who already have sort of done a little bit of research walked around looked at construction looked at different trades and say yeah masonry is what i think i really would like to do because i i you know when i look at this it's you know inspires me and so on and you know having a little bit of that uh, ability to create, you know, having an artistic side uh, is helpful. Um, that's good. Um, basic math skills, you know, good, you know, good and basic communication skills. Um, high school, I think, is uh, preferred that you finished high school. But I think the the line at this point in terms of minimum grade education is grade 10. But we would never suggest to anyone that they quit school to come in, you know, to, to get uh, started. I think it'd be better for you to finish that. There are lots of things you can learn in those final years of, of high school that will put you, you know, further ahead if you have participated in them. And the, and the work opportunities, I said that, you know, you can try out uh, uh, different trades while you're in high school and, and decide that, yeah, this is the one. Even if you don't settle on, say, masonry right from the get-go to experience that, is going to be a, 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 a you know a, a jumping board into most of the other trades too. So um, or if you chose carpentry and switched, you know, into masonry or whatever, that those lessons that you could learn in those years are uh, very beneficial, but not under that high stress or pressure. Um, so that would be a, a suggestion I would have um, for, for people starting out is um, do some research, decide what you want to do um then jump in and and do your best and see if it's if it's going to be your career well i really love that and and thank you for the plug for the oh yeah program because it really is a fantastic program that you know if you're 
if you already know that you like working with your hands and, and you want to get out of the classroom for an entire co-op semester, then it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to try that out. And we always encourage high school students and, you know, this is the, this is the advantage of being older and being able to look back, but you know, that's your time to take chances, right. And, and take risks and, and try to uh, see if, if a certain career is, uh, is well suited for you and you're well suited for it. Or if you can cross that off the list and say, okay, not that. <laughs> and then it's just as valuable knowing what you don't want to do as it is uh, knowing where your interests lie. And again, I love what you said about passion um, because we do find that when people are passionate about what they do, they tend to be good at it as well. And then they find success there as well. Um, Robert, uh, we'll end with you on this segment, and then I'll have one more question for all of you. But, you know, as an employer, uh, what do you look for in a new apprentice? Are there different basic requirements than what Tim just shared? And does someone need experience to get started? As far as the apprentices go, the first thing that you'd want to tell them all is, I think Tim touched on this, listen, we are Masons. We want to help people. We... Every mason that I've ever met, all they want to do is try and show an apprentice how to do their work or how to do work. They may be showing them all different things at one time, but that's what masons do. We want to help out the masons we, or we want to help out the apprentices because we like to share our passion with people. Um, what we're looking for a lot of times, and I learned this from Tim, and I'll never forget, and he was the one who said it exactly like this, and I've kept it with me all this time. And I'll tell every apprentice, Become good before you become fast. Pay attention to the work you're doing. Make sure that you are listening and understanding what's going on. Um, as far as a skill set, when you're starting the trade, that's a little hard to do because it's a lot of on-wall experience. You need to be on the wall to learn. It takes years to fully understand. I'm at 54 right now. I'm still learning, and it's never going to stop. And it just keeps getting better and better as I go on. I'm hoping, you know, well, it does. It gets a lot better. And yeah, that's about it. That's what we look for. We look for the people that can listen to us, the people that will trust us in, the, in us guiding them down the right path. And if once they do that and they can work alongside of other people, they're great, fantastic. Let's keep moving and move forward. And that's so, really that's great it. advice. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, so we have time for just one more question, as I mentioned to all of you, and it's a really important one. So for all the young people that are that are listening, that are considering getting into this trade, what is your advice uh, to anyone who's interested in, in getting started and, and pursuing this as a, as a trade? Uh, Julia, we'll start with you. Uh, my advice for anyone that's looking to get started is to follow your heart and your passion for whatever avenue of masonry that you seem interested in. You don't have to get stuck or, or lumped into one category just because there's so many avenues that you could uh, venture out into. I felt like I had to go down a path um, almost to a, a T that I kind of pictured in my head, but it was making me a little bit... Um, crazy. So getting out on my own and kind of doing my own thing and kind of seeing the ways that I can, I can push myself has been a really huge step forward for me. And just to see where anything can go, because there, the, the options are limitless with this trade. So just have fun and enjoy it and enjoy the experience. Well, I love that. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, we'll go to you for a piece of advice. Well, the one thing I've, I've told my kids is I've even tell the people at work this love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. Enjoy your work. Enjoy what you're doing. Make sure it is a passion. It's something that you really want to stand out. You really want to do it. Make sure it's something that when you're done at the end of the day and you're just about to walk away from that wall and you turn around and look at it, you're, you're proud of what you've done. If that's what you are, then this, this is the job for you. One other thing I want to add is something that Julia touched on. A lot of Masons or the stigma of Masonry is that we are all big, strong, muscular men that can do anything. It's not true. You don't have to be strong in this industry. But the one thing you do need, and this is where I think the women will benefit more than the men, is the ability not to quit. That's what we are. We're people that don't know how to quit. We are going to do our job right to the end. And we will never leave it behind. That's what bricklayers do. So if that's the type of person you are, then definitely this is something you have to get into. Well, I love that. Talk about taking pride. Um, Tim, we'll give you the last word here. 
piece of advice. Wow. You know, we've just had some really good advice. I don't know if I can top any of that, but, um, you know, f follow your dreams is for sure there. It, it it does involve hard work. No matter what you get into, it's going to involve hard work. There's, you know, the, the grass is generally not greener on the other side. So uh, find something that you enjoy doing, get into it, put your heart into it, put your best effort into it. And even if you don't stay in that for the rest of your life, you're going to learn a lot of things that will move you into the next uh, the next choice that you make. Um, yeah, listen what what Rob said was you know excellent. Like just listening to uh, your mentors is huge. Sometimes it's just listening to their stories and uh, allowing them to like tell you things about themselves and how they got where they're going. And then, you know, they see, oh, well, this, this guy or this girl really is interested because they'll, you know, they'll talk to me and listen to me, even though I'm, you know, 20, 30, 40 years older than them. And then they're going to start giving you opportunities you hadn't really thought of uh, just simply because you, you listen to them, not always about, you know, what you need to do, but just, you know, uh, listened uh, as, as a, as a friend. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I hope some of you uh, would like to try these opportunities. And as I said, we have programs running all the time and currently taking applications. So jump in. Thanks so much, Tim. And I do want to pick up on something what you said, uh, because we actually haven't, uh, we didn't get it too much into this, but it is that transitional skills. And, you know, what you learn, you can actually take that uh, with you, both in other positions, but also in your personal lives. I think one of the biggest benefits to these trade careers is is knowing how to do this for your own home, for you know your own sort of space, for for friends and family. That might be a downside, of course, <laughs> being called upon for that. But but it's certainly you know a, a skill that you pick up that is absolutely not going to go to waste. So. Um, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of the series and be sure to keep an eye out for our next one that will focus on uh, sustainability careers in construction. So if you're interested in, in you know, reducing or managing rather climate change and, and working to reduce carbon, stay tuned for that episode because we're going to highlight all the different careers in construction that actually help do that. A recording of this discussion will be posted on Bolt's YouTube channel, as well as the Speak Out page on our website, boltonline.org. I want to once again thank our industry panel who took time out of their very busy days to share their insights, experience, and advice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.